fellow Falcoholics, what is up? Welcome to episode 178 of the Falcoholic Live. I'm your host, Kevin Knight, joined by two wonderful co-hosts, one of which is here right now. You can see him. He is Adnan Ikic at Say Which Way. We will also be joined by Director of Guest Personnel, Evan Birchfield, in a little bit. But before we get to anything else, Adnan, how are we doing tonight? I'm doing well. The viewers have no idea that I just popped in here literally 10 seconds ago. No, no. Oh. Yeah, I was about to just, you know, blaze a trail by myself. And then Adnan just comes right in, just impeccable timing as always. So yeah, for all they know, I, I've been here just prepping, doing my, uh, you know, making some pre-show notes for the past 15 <laughs> minutes, just all on air the entire time. Yes, you know, and no one would ever know. It's seamless. That's how we do it here. You know, it's very high production quality. We cut out all the riffraff, focus on the takes. That's what we're doing again tonight, guys. And uh, welcome in. The topic of tonight will be free agency because, well, we spent a lot of time talking about the draft. And the draft is very fun to talk about, uh, don't get me wrong. But it would be a disservice if we didn't talk about free agency at least a little bit considering it's two and a half weeks away, three weeks away or less, something like that. So... Um, it's right around the corner. There's certainly a lot to cover. Uh, so we'll be diving into that a little bit. Obviously, if you guys have specific questions, as always, you can put those in the chat. You can, uh, send it in via donation and contractually obligate us to answer it. Um, the link to that's in the show description. I believe that's still streamlabs.com slash the Uh, but yeah, double check it in, in the description. Um, um again, and guys, agency is, uh, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but just while okay. talking about free agency, no, there's two things other than the pollen which signals the start of spring to me. Uh, one is NFL free agency, and, and the other is the uh, the NCAA tournament. So you yep. know when those things are going on, that's when you know the weather outside is beautiful. You know, probably outside having having some fun in the sun, and you get a notification that whatever team signed whatever guy. So you know it's a it's a great time of year. Yeah. It is. It's a wonderful time. It was a little bit of a weird week here in Syracuse, actually, because it was in the mid fifties for three straight days. So all of the we had like six inches of snow on the ground. All of it's gone. It is, however, snowing now, and it's supposed to snow eight inches on Friday. So a short-lived uh, spring interlude here <laughs> in the frozen It'll be north. Seventy-eight tomorrow in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, that's is very different. Very different temps. But yeah, guys, uh, we will be getting into some free agency topics. If you haven't seen the video we put out last week, breaking down the Falcons cap space, I'll be referencing it tonight. But if you want like an in-depth breakdown of how I came to these sort of numbers, you can check that video out. Uh, it's on the channel. Uh, basically a very, you know, important title, right? How much space can the Falcons create? I'll be referencing those numbers uh, tonight. But just, just so you know, if you want the details of how they get there, that's that's where to look for that. Uh, that's a good place to start. Obviously, we don't know how many of these space saving moves they will take, how many, you know, how many contracts they're going to give out in free agency, how aggressive they're going to be with sort of the cap space in terms of they could take they could go a lot of different directions. You know, they could go after they could go all in to try to win with Ryan. Right. Which is as, as unlikely as I think that is right now. Um, it's possible, you know, they could. They could create upwards of 40 million effective cap space, basically, if they maxed out a lot of stuff. Uh, and then they could sign a lot of free agents by signing them to longer contracts and, you know, backloading those deals. I think that uh, that's unlikely to happen based on what they did last year, but it, it's in play. It is a possibility. It's also entirely possible that they take a very similar approach as to what they did last year, which was spend very little give out mostly one-year deals and sort of try to, as Adnan's phrased it before, I think, you know, eat your vegetables, right? You 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 fix up the cap, you get rid of the dead money, you don't do a lot of cost-saving measures so that you have a much more robust cap situation going forward. And if they were to take that approach again this year, uh, 2023 could be quite a windfall in terms of how much cap space they would have in comparison to this year. They would have very little dead money going into next year. Um, so it really just depends on the strategy they want to take. Um, but yeah, guys, like I said, if you have questions, throw those in the chat. You can also donate uh, and we will be contractually obligated. And of course, as you can tell by the title, we will have Falcons legend, former undrafted free agent linebacker, Paul Worlow joining us. He's going to be on here around 9 p.m. Um, so stick around for that later in the show as well. But uh, yeah, just some quick numbers before we get started. 
Uh, the Falcons are like negative in cap space right now. Technically, I think they're like 5.8 million un- like over the cap. That's not that big a deal considering that they don't really have to be under the cap until the new league year starts in March, but just something to keep in mind. Right now, their draft class is projected to cost about the same amount, you know, 5.9 million or so. So they're sort of effectively down 11.8 million. Um, and through various, that, that might sound like it's a really bad place to be. It's nowhere near as bad as it was last year. And they have a lot more. Last year, they needed <laughs> yeah. the Julio trade just to afford the draft class. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, like, it's not that desperate. It might sound bad that they're down 11.8 million. It's not that bad. Um, hey, the they Saints have are like yeah. 100 million or something. Yeah, it's, it's bad. I mean, the Saints are going to be basically just doing the same thing they did last year all over again which is cutting some players and then just restructuring everyone that they can. And it's just going to make the same problem happen next year. Um, and they're just going to be praying that they, uh, the cap just explodes every single year to keep that, them uh, in check. That, uh, and I know we're, we're just like talking about, we're going off course a little bit, but that does make me think, what was Terry Fontenot thinking uh, <laughs> as the Saints assistant GM the past few years when Mickey Loomis has just been kicking that can down the road year after year? Because we know that, Terry Fontenot most likely had nothing to do with that, just given the way that we've seen him operate the Falcons last year in a similar situation where he could have easily last year done the same thing as the Saints, you know, yeah. on max restructures, um, uh, full, full contract extensions, all the works. But then the Falcons this season would be in a, in a really bad place when it comes to the cap. So I'm wondering if he if he was internally thinking a few years ago, like with the Saints, like what what the hell are we doing here? Like let's just you know let's just take this for like a year or two the way he, that he's doing with the Falcons, and just sort of like like I mentioned before, eat eat your vegetables and then you get out of it. And you don't have to worry about it because the Saints have been in cap hell since they signed Jarius Bird like a decade ago. <laughs> oh my gosh. I remember and, being so pissed off that they did that signing too, but it ended yeah, up not working out for them. There were rumors but. that he was going to like uh, come to the Falcons. Possibly, it was a Pro Bowl yeah. free safety with the uh, with the Bills. Mm-hmm, went to, mm-hmm. went to New Orleans and he completely like fell off. But I mean, I, I get it. Like you wanted to go all in for Drew Brees and whatnot, but to do it every year for like 10, 11 years, and to still keep doing it now after Drew Brees is gone and. Clearly, the Saints aren't contenders. Sean Payton has gone too. It's just, I don't know. It's just weird to me. Yeah, it is. It and like like you said, like it does beg the question of did was that a strategy that Fontenot sort of signed off on, or was it not necessarily something he he was a fan of? And it you could say also that the Saints were sort of in a different position as the Falcons. Some Falcons fans maybe would disagree with that, but the Saints were trying to you know contend right away. Uh, and they really just kept pushing it. I, I think the writing was on the wall for the Saints each of the last few years that like they just weren't really good enough to get over the hump. And I, I the defense was good enough, I think, but Drew Brees was just not getting any better. They they weren't surrounding him with the type of offensive weapons that he needed, especially as a declining quarterback. And then it was sort of like depending on the offensive line, which is very good. And the run game to support that offense and to win with a run game and a defense in the in the NFL right now is just really hard to do. So it was it was a questionable strategy, and they're paying for it now. Um, but it seems like he's taking a different tact here in Atlanta. Do you think that's the right move, Anon? Is to I mean, do you support trying to to because there's two ways they can go. We still don't really know which way they're going to go. This is a big going to be a big topic of what we talk about tonight, but. Um, There's two paths. You know, they could try to maximize Ryan's last few years here, which probably means they're giving Ryan an extension, probably means they're restructuring a lot of guys and trying to really go all in this year. And that basically, to to believe that's the case, you're sort of acknowledging that, like, last year they didn't really do a lot of win-now moves, but they didn't really have the flexibility to do it. They didn't really have the cap to do it. They... They wanted to sort of evaluate and then decide. And their decision is, we think we can still win with this. We're going to go all in this year. Or do you think it's more the opposite that last year's moves were actually their real strategy, which is we're going to clean up the cap. We're going to take a lot of draft picks that we're planning to be contributors, not in 2021, but in 2022, 2023, you know, guys like Richie Grant, Ogan Deji, Taquan Grant. These were all, and Jalen Mayfield too, honestly, 
all guys that are developmental, high ceiling sort of guys. Um, and it's sort of revealing that their true path may have been, we're actually going to rebuild this roster under our new direction on defense and on offense. And, you know, may, maybe Matt Ryan will be a part of it, maybe not. But it's sort of a rebuild type situation. So of those two strategies, what do you think is going to be the, the eventual decision? I think it's the latter. And I'm fully in support of it being the latter. Just because, you know, like I mentioned, and like uh, we both mentioned many times over the course of the show and last year, they could have gone, a, they didn't really have much cap flexibility last year. They had much more than the Saints, for example. They could have gone like balls to the wall, full restructures, you know, all in on just generating as much cap space as possible last year and going, you know, win now last season. And I think that if that was the strategy, we would have seen that happen right away, right from the get-go last year. Um, I am not a fan of that strategy, not for this roster. Like, maybe if this team was, you know, one piece or two pieces away from, you know, really contending, uh, maybe had they got gotten to the NFC Championship game this year, and you can tell that they, they're just flowing with talent. Then yeah, I I would be all for going all in, doing what the Rams did, ship even trades, even trade draft picks to win now pieces. I guarantee you the Rams don't regret that, and they won't regret that even in the coming years when it starts to hurt. But this team was a seven one team last year. I don't think that they had the talent of a seven one team. They had the um, they had the point difference of a four win team last year. They won a lot of really close games. I think they were something ridiculous, like five and one, six and one in like one score games last season. Uh, and I don't think that it would be a wise move to uh, to just do what the Saints have been doing. I really like and I really support the strategy of okay, you can you take your lumps, try to sign some bargain bin guys. And, you know, if they if that happens again this year, if Fontenot happens again, do, does that again this season, I'll be all for it because this roster was in uh, was in need of a rebuild when Fontenot and uh, Arthur Smith got here. This cap space was completely tied up because Dimitrov and Dan Quinn's short-sighted moves when they were trying to save their jobs in their last year here in Atlanta. And I really like untying that uh, going with going with a nice rebuild strategy and then really really going for it in the coming years uh, even if those coming years are with or without Matt Ryan um, and you know it, it's just it's just a smart long-term strategy and Fontenot and Arthur Smith they they were given long-term extensions so I think they came in here knowing from the start that hey we can do we can do this correctly we're not going to cut any corners we're going to build the foundation of this house up correctly from the start uh, to make sure that it doesn't come crashing down on us later on. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of it. And if we see another off season of bargain bin moves, I know people will be all up in arms that we're not signing all of these big free agents, but it will be better for it long-term. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And also good time to welcome in Evan Birchfield, Director of Guest Personnel. Evan, how are you doing tonight? Hey, guys. I'm good. I was, uh, I guess that echo thing might have been from me. I don't know. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, sometimes it's just, it just picks up other people's. Like if you uh, if you have, if it's going through your speakers in particular, it like just yeah. has a t- well, Sometimes it does. Wired. Yeah. yeah. I was using sometimes the wired it- ones and I don't know if, if I changed to the wireless one so maybe it's working now but maybe it's always weird you never know with these things sometimes it picks it up sometimes it doesn't but uh yeah the question i just asked adnan that i wanted to get your take on as well was if given the choice between the two strategies for the falcons this offseason you know one would probably be going all in with matt ryan to try to maximize his final years in atlanta probably extending him you know sort of maximizing the cap being more aggressive this year than they were last year or going with the rebuild, which is maybe what was hinted at last year. It's sort of hard to tell. Uh, sort of, again, being a little bit more careful with 
the cap and probably not necessarily restructuring everyone and, you know, going all in on free agents this year, um, going with the more long-term rebuild plan. What do you think the team is going to do based on admittedly very little that we've seen so far, but your sort of gut feeling? I mean, it's kind of tough to predict, but I think they're just going to kind of keep walking that fine line. Like last year, um, they didn't want to say they were, you know, rebuilding, it seems like a nasty word to them, um, but it kind of well, was obvious. That that if, if they go, if they admit that it's a rebuild, people won't buy tickets. Not they're not they, going to ever admit yeah, it, but yeah. right. <laughs> but th- I mean, that's kind of what they have to do um, due to the cap situation and stuff in the in in the current roster too. It's not like they have, you know, they're one of these teams that's loaded at a bunch of positions. Like there's a lot of positions that. There's starters there, sure, but they can be upgraded um, if you want to be like an actual team that's ready to compete. Um, you know, linebacker being one of them. It's like Deion Jones uh, sounds like he's done in Atlanta. Um, Foy's, what, a free agent. Um, and, you know, I kind of liked what I saw from the linebacker group aside from Deion Jones. Um, Michael Walker, I think, is going to continue to get better. Um, his PFF scores were pretty good for somebody who didn't play a lot. Um but that's just one of the positions where, you know, they can obviously upgrade and probably need to. But, you know, can they do it all in one offseason? No. Um, Matt Ryan, I mean, you look around the NFL. Um, if the Falcons did, for some reason, want to move on from him this offseason, I mean, what are you moving on to? There's a lot of teams that would love to have uh, Matt Ryan on their team. Uh, I think that's just kind of literally looking at a position where there's not really a huge need. Maybe if you want to, you know, in a perfect world, that's a position where you have, you know, somebody being groomed, but uh, not not really the fault of the current um, regime, but the past one where they just refuse to groom anybody behind Matt Ryan or even take a shot in the dark. I think one of the only quarterbacks they actually drafted was like, um, Oh shoot! Now I'm like Sean Renfrey. Yeah, Renfrey. Renfrey. Uh, Renfrey. Yeah. Um, and he was like what a sixth or seventh round pick. So they weren't taking the position seriously at all. Um, you know, Banker was like really the only guy who was groomed, and he never really got a shot to even be like a backup realistically because of injury. And also, they had Matt Schaub, who was not going to be the future in Atlanta. The goat. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, to answer your question uh, quicker. Um, I think it's a rebuild. It's not fun, but it's necessary. And at the same time, they want to compete. They, as Adnan said, they want to sell tickets. Um, They're not going to come out and say, yeah, we're, we're rebuilding guys, but come watch us anyways. Like that's marketing wise. Isn't very wise. Um, So we'll see what happens, but yeah, I, I think it's definitely, you know, Kyle Pitts is one of those talents that you just couldn't pass up. A lot of people saying, oh, well, if it's a rebuild, then why are you taking like, you know, a tight end or whatever? But he's one of those players in a rebuild where he's going to be. I mean, we saw what kind of year he had ignored the only one touchdown. Um, That's definitely going to go up, hopefully. Um, But we saw what kind of talent he was, you know, in his rookie season, had one of the best. uh, Aside from like Mike Ditka, like the best tight end season ever, basically for a rookie. Um, so, yeah, that's a building block, you know, that you're going to have going in the future. Same with, like, Chris Lindstrom, obviously, A.J. Terrell. I mean, there's a couple pieces there, but they've got to build a lot more if they want to actually have, like, a team that's ready to go to the Super Bowl or at least compete for a Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm just reading the tea leaves from last year. Like, it, there is certainly a case to be made that, like, they really didn't have much choice, but I think also – if they really were trying to win with Ryan and maximize his last few years in the NFL, you think that they probably would have gone a little harder last year than they did. They, they really didn't at all. Like they didn't sign any multi-year deals. They could have gotten more than they, than they did. They could have signed a lot of multi-year deals and pushed cap into future seasons. Mm -hmm. They could have restructured. I mean, they restructured pretty much everyone they could, but you know, they, I don't know if they could have created a ton more cap space, but they could have spent it on some higher end free agents and spread it out in multi-year deals. And they really didn't. So the other thing was like early in the season, it'd be different if Calvin Ridley stepped away late in the season, but it was early in the season. They never really 
look to improve the wide receiver group like at all. Um, they brought back uh, who was a Marvin Hall, like by like <laughs> who like he, did like, never I, play, yeah, right. Um, they just kind of said, okay, well Ridley's gone, but now it's up to Tajay Sharp. You know, um, we're gonna need Russell Gage to step up, and and he did. I mean, considering Russell Gage, you know, was coming how he was coming in the season, all of a sudden he's like your number one target pretty much, um, and he had some really good games late, but he's a free agent too, right? So it's like. That, that position is going to be super thin. Yeah. And I think that's part of it too. Like they, they had an, they, if they were really serious about competing last year, which I always mm-hmm. sort of thought was just BS and I don't blame them for saying it. Of course they're going to say that, but, um, they could have done a lot more if they really wanted to compete last year and they didn't. Um, now does that say anything about their 2022 plans? You know, it's hard to be sure. My instinct is that this is all this is and has always been a rebuild. Uh, this has always been the plan. They would never admit it, and no one ever would in the NFL. It's not like it's shocking, you know. It's not like I'm offended by it or anything, but it makes our job harder because they say one thing and do another. But NFL, that's just that's how this business works. Um, they're never going to be truthful. They're never going to reveal their true plans to anyone else outside the building um, because they don't have to, and they shouldn't, you know, especially in the off season. Um, so. I think it's going to be a rebuild. Does the rebuild involve Matt Ryan or not? I still don't know. Um, I think if they if they want to keep Ryan, he will be extended this year. And if they're planning on going after another quarterback, he will not be extended this year. Um, he will probably still get some sort of restructure done because the fact you know his cap hit is forty eight million. They need to do something about that. But. Um, you know, there's, it's not also not off the table. Like if they don't touch Ryan's contract at all, um, they don't extend him. They don't do like a, a void your restructure. They don't really do anything. Um, to me, that may even be a hint that they're hoping to shop him after the draft, uh, assuming they get the quarterback they want. And who knows which, which quarterback that is, if it's Malik at eight or if it's Desmond Ritter in the second round or whatever. I mean, who knows? Um, but if they don't touch his contract at all, it does sort of suggest that it's even more of a rebuild than we thought. Um, and they're either planning to trade him this year or next year, because that would mean that, the, you know, it's more favorable to trade him basically if they don't restructure and they don't get any more bonus money or any more guarantees in that contract. But we won't know anything until free agency hits. Um, at this point, like I said in my video, which you guys, if you guys haven't checked out, check that out. It's on the channel. You know, I think the, Fal- the Falcons could have upwards of f- $40 million in cap space if they make a lot of moves. Um, that may sound like a lot of cap space, and it's not a tiny amount of cap space or anything. It's enough to make some moves, but there are, there are a lot of things to consider with that money. And we'll start off by talking about the, the sort of priority guys, the Falcons would want to resign because that's going to take up a significant chunk of that money, depending on how many of these guys they want to bring back. Um, so just starting at the top in terms of what players were making last year, we already know two of the top, the, the two top guys are not going to be back because they were cut. Um, Dante Fowler was already cut he was not under contract next year. I know there was some confusion about that. Um, but uh, he was not actually under contract next year. It was a void year. Um, but they cut him before the start of the league year for reasons that I don't fully understand. Uh, I'm not, I mean, I don't think he's gonna, he was going to net them a great comp pick or anything, but it is sort of puzzling to me that they moved on from him. There must be some reason. don't really know why. Uh, with Matt Goto, there was a reason. Uh, we found out. They cut him because his contract actually would have told uh, because he was spent the entire year on the pup list and it was his final year. Unlike Calvin Ridley, who had an option year after this year, uh, Matt Goto's contract actually would have repeated. He would have, again, been under contract on the second round tender for over $3.3 million, and the Falcons were not willing to commit to him at that amount, clearly. Um, So those two, I think we both know, aren't coming back. The next big one that I would that I would bring up uh, is probably the biggest ticket free agent. I think when it's all said and done, and that would be Foye Oluokun, uh, the linebacker, his, his value by some sites is like 6 million by, by some other numbers. Some people think he's going to be making over 10 million. 
And depending on where he falls in that range will probably determine whether the Falcons try to bring him back. I think if it's like six to eight, it's likely they bring him back. If it's anything more than eight, I don't know that they touch that. It's just too expensive for a linebacker. Um, so yeah, uh, Adon, I'll let you get the first crack at that. What do you think about Luwakun coming back and how much would you be willing to, to pay? Um, it, it does depend on the money because yeah. uh, it's not a situation where, I mean, don't get me wrong, Foy, Foy, was, Foy is good. I really like Foy. He's a friend of the show. He's been on the show in the past. Uh, he's a great story. Sixth round pick who came and who put in the work, uh, probably should have been starting a year earlier than he was, but you know, that's neither here nor there. And I'm really happy for him that he's going to be able to, uh, cash out and make some real generational money in this free agency period. Um, that being said, he's not a blank check type of player. And by that, I mean he's not someone who you all, you have to bring back by any means necessary. Uh, there are some guys in the NFL like that where, you know, you have to work things out. But uh, Floyd wasn't – Floyd was impactful. He was your best linebacker last year, but he's not in that elite upper echelon of, uh, of linebackers in the NFL for you to be giving him that much money. And – uh, like you said, if it's ten plus million dollars, I I can't see the team committing to him uh, at that you know at that contract. If uh, if they do lose him, then that will tell me that linebacker will likely be a pretty big priority in the draft, at least uh, on one of the first two days, if not the first round. Then maybe on day two, uh, because. They already have a lot of money committed to the linebacker position in the form of yeah. Deion Jones, and you know, if if it were up to the Falcons at this point, this regime isn't the one that re-signed Deion Jones. That was Dan Quinn and uh, Thomas Dimitrov, and that was before Deion Jones, you know, lost interest uh, <laughs> in in really giving it his all every single play on, on the field. So I understand why they gave him that money. Um, but yeah, Deion Jones's contract is pretty, pretty unmovable pre June 1st at the very least. Um, it would be a neg. you would, you would be losing uh, money regarding. You can't cut him. Yeah. yeah. You can't cut him. If, if you, you cut, cut him, him. June 1st, you lose $4 million. Even if you cut him post June 1st, the cap savings aren't really worth it. It would only be like $1 million. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, I think we'll be stuck with Deion Jones at the very least for this year. And then we'd probably look at, look into, uh, into moving him next year when, when you would save over $13 million, uh, in cap space by cutting him, uh, because he has no guaranteed money next, next off season. Uh, but it, it is a shame to think that you could lose Foy because of that Deion Jones contract, because, you know, it, the dead money is there one year too early. But, you know, these are the difficult decisions that you have to make. And, uh, you know, I uh, I would love to have Foy, Foy back. Uh, I would even go up to eight and a half, maybe even nine million dollars for him. Uh, but 10 plus, I, I don't I don't see how the team can do that. Yeah, it's tough. Um, yeah, with Dion, the only way they could get out of paying him is to trade him because um, his salary is pretty much guaranteed this year, so they can't really cut him. But if they were to trade him, if they trade him before his roster bonus hits, I think it's like the third or fourth day of the league year, so like mid-March, um, they would still save like nine over $9 million. Um, and the team picking him up, I believe, only owes him like 10 million or so so it's a movable deal for someone looking for like a, a, a in the right system i still think Deion jones could be good and i think if he's like interested in playing for someone like if he goes to join dan quinn or something like that or raheem morris or whatever um i think he could still be a good player so i think he'll have some interest um but uh 
I don't think they're getting like big compensation for him because I think teams know it's a salary dump. So yeah, I would move him for like a day three pick. At this yeah, point. it's probably a fifth. Honestly, is what they're looking at. A fifth, even a sixth rounder. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got just a sixth rounder for for Dion. Uh, some fans will probably be upset, um, but no, like you're you'd be saving nine. Like that is. A full. Uh, don't look at it as you're trading Deion Jones for a sixth rounder. Look at it as you're trading Deion Jones for a sixth rounder and Foye, Foye Oluwakin. Yes, because they can't sign Foye and keep Deion. It's one or the other. I mean, theoretically, they could keep both, but it's just I don't think that's really going to happen. Um, you know, I, the most likely thing is that they do find a trade partner for Deion. Hopefully, hopefully get a fifth. You know, I think there's a chance if a team really likes Deion. That they could possibly get a fourth yeah. or a fifth, but I'd be calling Dallas like yeah. right now and offering because you know you know Dan Quinn would love to have him most likely. He he would love to go play for Dan Quinn. Maybe he'll actually give a damn on the football field if he played for Dan Quinn again. Yeah. So you know, uh, I mean, I, I would definitely if I were if I were Fontenot, no, I'd be uh, I'd be uh, I'd be shopping around. I'd yeah. be calling as many teams as possible and, you know, inquiring about their possible interest for Deion Jones on the cheap regarding yeah. draft draft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if it's before that roster bonus kicks in, the compensation will be lower. However, if the Falcons end up having to eat that roster bonus, they're probably looking for a better pick. So it just depends um, with, you know, do you care more about the cap or do you care more about the pick? Because if you eat the roster bonus... He's actually on, you know, a decently cheap contract for the next two years for the team picking him up. Um, so then you're probably looking at like a fourth or even maybe a third, but you're not saving nearly as much. You know, you're probably only saving like $5 million. So um, it just depends on what they want to do. And also like if there's, if they can make, get the trade done or not. But if the, if the deadline does happen to pass for his roster bonus, um, they can still trade him. It's just not as financially advantageous but yeah on the on the Aluakan uh, topic Evan are you in favor of re-signing him too um I mean in a perfect world I'd love to have him back um I think you know seeing what he did under Dean Pease you know leading the league in tackles like that's pretty impressive but at the same time as Adnan said it's a business um you know the guy's smart went to Yale obviously but he, uh, how much was he get? How much did he get paid last year? Like six hundred thousand or something. <laughs> he was like one of the cheapest players on the roster. <laughs> yeah, he, he, you know, he's gonna get paid whether it's here or elsewhere, um, and he deserves it. So yeah, uh, I mean, I'd love to have him back, but again, business. Um, you can't always, you know, sign the people you want. That's happened throughout NFL history. Um, just players, you know. Since free agency has been a thing, that's what happens. You lose good guys sometimes, and he could be a casualty of that. And, um, I mean, we'll see what happens. But I'd, I'd love to have him back. I just think if it's anything over $10 million, they're not going to be able to yeah. realistically do that. Um, no, definitely for, not. For a position that, I mean, as much as great as he was at playing linebacker, that's not moving the needle, you know, if they're in a rebuild where that's going to definitely win you games and stuff like that to where – they'll put money elsewhere um, at a different position or whatever. But yeah. And then with the Dion Jones thing, I mean, some fans will be mad, but if you watched games this year, you'll see how you saw how terrible he looked. This isn't unfortunately the Dion Jones of years past where like they were literally talking about him as being like one of the better linebackers in the NFL. It's just kind of sad to see how far he's fallen recently. Um, so yeah, if you can get like a six or something for him, I'd be fine with that. Because um, he just he, he, I mean, PFF had him as like I think one of the literally worst linebackers this past year. So it was eye test and you know PFF when those two match, it's pretty much set in stone how a <laughs> uh, season went. So yeah, yeah, that's he was, and part of it looked like he just wasn't interested either, which is a big yeah. indictment in my opinion. But um, you know, I think that's a one way ticket out of Atlanta. Um, and, you know, hopefully to some place where he, he could be more interested in playing and it ends up getting the Falcons some cap relief and a solid pick. So we'll, we'll see. Um, the next, the next one on my list in terms of importance, 
uh, would be wide receiver Russell Gage. Um, this one, I think, is more of an open question, probably depending on how you feel about his fit in Arthur Smith's offense. I mean, obviously, he played a lot more outside later in the season after Ridley got hurt. He actually looked you know, decent at it. Um, but yeah, Evan, I'll let you take the first crack at that one. What do you think about re-signing Gage? I don't know what his what the projection is for how much he'd be going for a year. But, I mean, I like towards the end, you know, I think he found his footing as, like, wide receiver one. Fine, you know, he didn't go into the season expecting that. Um, and I think he's, like, an ideal wide receiver two. I think he can take that step. I don't think he'll ever be a wide receiver one, and I think that's fine. But I think at his best, he's a good, very good wide receiver two. And unfortunately, this team just didn't have it, and it was literally him. And then there was like a long distance between him and the next guy. Um, once Rid- Ridley was obviously off the field, I'd love to have him back. I think he's you know kind of like Foy, one of those guys that's like Foy came in. I think he played safety and um, mm-hmm. at Yale, and then comes here and plays linebacker. Russell Gage was what special teams dude, and did, yeah. like was like a gunner or something crazy athletic, but. Um, it may be played corner, right? Or something. Yeah. Didn't he? yeah. He played corner at first. Then he played a little bit of receiver and a lot yeah. of special teams, but yeah. I mean, he seems like a good guy, a uh, very good story. So yeah, I'd love to have him back. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's actually going to end up happening again. He, he made, um, if this is correct, Foy made 651,000 last year and gauge made 654. So these are two guys who, you know, were some of the cheapest on the team and they arguably were some of the most important last year. Um, so I'm sure he's going to get paid whether it's here or elsewhere. I mean, chase the money. It's a business, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, it's tough. You know, I, I, I think he, he, early on, like last year, I just said, he's going to walk and I hope he gets a big contract elsewhere for the comp pick. Um, but you know, he did play better. He did play more on the outside. I don't think Arthur Smith values slot receivers pretty much at all. I think he's going to try to go cheap there if he can. Someone like Austin Trammell, you know, makes a lot of sense. Undrafted guy with some upside that can be a reliable set of hands and that sort of thing. But, um, if Gage can play on the outside, that changes things. And I think there's an argument to be made that if Ridley's leaving, which I think we all think is pretty much guaranteed to happen, um, it would make sense to give Ryan a nut, like some continuity if they are sticking mm-hmm. with Ryan. Now, if they're not really planning to stick with Ryan past this year or even this year, I mean, I think it's unlikely that he leaves this year, who, but yeah. Oh, I was going to say who like, you know, I know we know what the expected free agents is. So this can change quickly if they start, you know, signing some of these guys back, but like who's actually projected to be on the roster at this point that you, you assuming everyone who's a free agent leaves like wide receiver wise i know <laughs> looking at uh sport track or spot track um Zacchaeus is a free agent gage yep. is a free agent blake's a free agent tajay sharp's a free agent um and then assuming ridley gets traded like who does that leave that ryan's actually thrown the ball to yeah i mean very little uh, kyle pitts <laughs> <laughs> right but i mean like purely like a pure receivers like maybe we can go in the next year with no wide receivers you know yeah, just be, run a new tactic. offense with with all offensive linemen <laughs> hits and and a couple more tight ends yep well lee yeah. smith retired so yeah they, if we can't even get that yeah no it's like literally frank darby is the only one frank, only receiver right, under right. contract right now that would be um someone that the Falcon, like that Ryan's thrown an actual pass. I think he threw like two passes to Frank Darby. The, Trammell played for one game, right? Yes. I don't know that he actually got a but target. Catch any. But okay. is Christian Blake a free agent? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In it's terms li- like, it's literally yeah. like everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Lamade Zacchaeus, Christian Blake, Russell Gage, uh, Tajay Sharp. Yeah. Cordero Patterson, Tajay Sharp, you know. Everybody <laughs> is a free agent. Yeah, now, like, if they everyone. want to bring any of these guys back, like, if they want to bring Zacchaeus back, that's not going to be, you know, a problem. Like, they're going to be able to bring him back. Um, if they want to bring Tajay Sharp back, which I think they should. Um, again, not going to be a major expense. They'll be able to get him pretty affordably. But it's just like, you know, they need to bring back some of these guys at least. Which ones, we don't know. 
but um <laughs> this yeah. reminds me of like madden where yeah. you start a franchise and you're just like i don't want any of these people i'll bring yeah. my own receivers and <laughs> yeah. just sign randoms <laughs> yep it's like uh, no i don't like this um trade for every draft pick like in madden yes that would be fun yeah. i'd be down um, trade the whole roster pretty much <laughs> hey, draft, think of how much fun we'd have uh, on the draft show yeah that would be a great that would be tremendous content like if we had that many picks but unfortunately you know we'd never get to actually do that but i would enjoy it i would definitely enjoy it okay. um falcons pick twice we can't go into depth about this player that they got they're picking again in yeah we're points. picking again in two picks so we gotta we gotta wrap this up yeah but uh, <laughs> um let's see another okay other big names um young way Koo. i think we all think he's coming back right um yes. And, I mean, he's earned it, and yeah, you know, again, not to go back to marketing, but it's a huge thing, and the fan base loves him. You remember yeah. when everybody was pissed that he wore number seven for like <laughs> two weeks? Get over and it. Now, Seven's a great now, number. Nobody, okay. Yeah. yeah, nobody cares anymore. Um, he, I mean, I, I, I was a critic early because I noticed they like didn't let him kick from like fifty out, and I never understood that. <laughs> but then he made he made some this past year, and I think I, he's he never definitely earned it. Yards out. I don't think he's yeah. ever missed from fifty plus. That's why it was puzzling. It's like, uh, not last year, but the year before, it was like they just refused to give him it. If it was like fifty over, they punted or went for it. Yep. I'm like, yeah, it was odd. You know, why not take a three? But this past year, I mean, they let him kick more, and I think he definitely deserved. He, um, you know, between that and. Onside kick didn't play a huge part this past year, but I mean, if you're in a pinch and you need an onside kick, I mean, he's yeah probably way better than everyone else in the league. So. <laughs> he's really good at it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll also, like, actually contribute when it comes to, like, I mean, I'm not saying he's going to go out there and rip someone's head off, but you know, he, he's yeah. had a fumble recovery in the past. He, he, like, he gets his nose in there on, uh, on the coverage team. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He does. Um, he tries. Yeah, he gives effort. That's all. That's all you can ask for, really. Yeah, he, he's a hometown kid too. He yeah, yes. He yeah, nice. Played for the Atlanta Legends. Uh, is maybe the only AAF success story to come out of that league. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're still talking about one of the best kickers in the NFL. Uh, someone who's in the middle of his prime, who is going to be able to kick for the next ten years because kickers have a very, very long shelf life. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and they don't they don't do a a whole lot in free agency either. If you notice, like no. a lot of the great kickers, I mean, it was rare. Like Adam Vinatieri going from the Patriots to the Colts, and he still had a good career there. But a lot yeah. of times, like Justin Tucker, I mean, he's probably going to be a Raven forever. A lot yeah. of the really good kickers just kind of stay put because it's like you have it, it's good like it, it's good value because you have like yeah. this immense weapon who you know. If you don't have a kicker, it, you, it's really bad, as we know with the with the last decade of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, not not counting last, the last couple of years. Yeah. But, I mean, to have someone who can just nail it from 50-plus yards consistently mm-hmm. in today's NFL, and to be able to get him for, I don't only cost like $3 million. And I, I know only like $3 million. <laughs> is nothing. Yeah. But, I mean, it's still like, you know, I would rather pay – who three million dollars and you know something else that you can get for three million dollars right yeah i mean i suspect ku will want at least four but again it's not like enormous ridiculous it's, money it's perfect it's like literally perfect i'm not mentioned he kicked it georgia southern or whatever yeah yeah but also like to be able to kick in that environment is so much better than like what if it was between the falcons and like the Bills or the Packers. Or, I mean, the Bills don't need a kicker, but for example, like a team that's like outside, I mean, that's, you're probably not going to be as accurate, you know, especially when it comes to December and stuff like that, when you've been able to kick in, like it makes sense from a standpoint of, okay, I can kick easier in a dome or whatever, you know. Yeah, dome speaking whatever of the Bills, Corey Carter mentioned it, Tyler Bass also. Yep. Oh. yep. Yep. That's just, that's just kicker you now, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, my guess is it's probably because Justin Tucker's making the most of any kicker. He's making $5 million per year, which, again, isn't like an enormous amount of money. But it's uh, also, the best. that's also the greatest kicker of all yes, time. Yes, exactly. But Daniel Carlson, who is not the greatest kicker of all time, just signed his deal, and it's $4.6 a year. So I, I assume that's what Ku's agent's asking for. Um, 
But again, if you sign Ku to like a four year deal at four point six million per, you could easily get his cap hit this year to like a million dollars. Like it would not and it wouldn't even like really stress out the contract that much in future uh, years. So it's like And it's, uh yeah. for the record, the franchise tag, if you want to go that route, would be five and a half million dollars. Yeah, not at, not even remotely worth it. He's also he's technically a restricted free agent, so you could give him a tender. Like a second round tender, but that tender is like almost four million, or maybe it's even a little over four million, as it is. So it's like, it's not really like you're saving like six hundred k. Like you might as well just sign him to an extension at that point. So, um, uh, so I, I think that they will. But I love Young Way Koo, but if someone does want to give us a second rounder for him, <laughs> it, well, yeah, I mean that would be the upside <laughs> of the second round tender, right? But no one's gonna do that. No one ever really buys the second round tenders. So yeah, not um, for you could always uh. You know, the next Evan McPherson. Yeah, right uh, there the you corner. go. It's true. Um, the other really big one is obviously Corderell Patterson, who we've talked about a lot. Again, the money is the thing. Like, I know, I think PFF did, like, estimated contracts, and they had him leaving Atlanta for, like, $6 million a year, which if they let him leave for $6 million, that's just that's just dumb. Like, y- you can pay him $6 million a year. I mean, I would go... I would go six million a year, like a three-year, eighteen million deal. I don't think that's too much to ask, and I think it's a fair amount for him, and I think it's good for both sides. So if he really wants to stay here, and Which six it million seems a year, like he does, yeah, and it's six million a year. I mean, activity. that's the thing. Like if they don't, if he goes, if he goes and signs somewhere for six million a year, and it's not Atlanta, that's that's all the proof you need that this team is rebuilding, like that they're not serious about contending in the next two or three years, because. You know, I, I guess I could see letting him walk if you're really not serious about contending like in the next two years, because it's like he's already over 30. Um, you know, he'll be he'll be 31 next year. Um, you're just like, look, he's not going to be able to maximize anything here. We're, we're really not going to be winning very much. So we'll just get the comp pick and we'll let him walk. Whatever. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're serious about competing at all or you just want to give your team a good weapon that that's reliable and, and just fits the scheme really well. And we know this just pay him the 6 million a year, man, just do it. I mean, I think we can all agree on that, but if somebody's offering 10 million, him a one year, 10 million deal, deal or something like that, like, you know, go get your money Patterson. Like if you want, like if that's what you want, that's totally fine. Totally understand it. But the Falcons should be at least able to offer him 6 million per. I mean, it's just for what he offered as like a, equivalent to like a wide receiver three and like a high end running back jack of all trades player um i think six million is more than fair like to offer like i mean i don't don't even think that's like extravagant at all so um, if they're talking about coup maybe getting three or something right right exactly (laughs) so um and i think having like a guy who's bought into whatever your plan is like usually free agency when you know even when some guys want to stay They'll give kind of that like answer of, oh, yeah, I mean, I want to, you know, go back and, you know, but we'll see what happens. It's a business or whatever. Like he's made it like so public that he wants to stay in Atlanta. Yeah. Like it's not even a question of like if somebody offers, you know, similar money or just slightly more like he may turn it down to stay in Atlanta. But that also takes Atlanta, you know, offering him a fair contract for what he's, you know what he's worth but i think it's just a perfect matchup between the falcon staff and patterson to where it benefits both for him to stay but you know we'll see what happens yeah yeah all right well it looks like we may have a uh, a very special guest attempting to uh, join the show here so give me just a second guys uh hold on yeah i know we had some tips coming with some other questions i'll try to get to those after our guest is here, um, but yeah, let me see if we can get Mr. Paul Worlow in here, folks. Hello, hello. Can you, you hear, hear me? me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, guys? Hey, hey how you doing, Paul? Oh, I'm doing well. Kevin's hosting, you. you just won't see yeah. me. Yeah. No, there's nothing wrong. Oh, it's just, yeah, you won't see me, so... <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, well, Paul Worlow, it's awesome to, to see you, uh, been a big fan, right, right about when you joined the team is when I started actually covering the team professionally. So it was sort of an interesting coincidence, but, uh, obviously you're a fan favorite. A lot of folks here are excited to hear from you. Um, I know you're, uh, coaching at Delaware now, right? 
Yep. Yeah. You're, you're being cool. too kind too, man. But yeah, I'm coaching at Delaware now, so I can't. I can't get away from football. So yeah, yeah. Well, we'll definitely <laughs> want to hear about that uh, and let uh, I know Evan. I'm sure has some questions for you too. He's a big fan. Um, but yeah, uh, let's let's get into it. Uh, I'm gonna send out some tweets that you're here. But yeah, Evan, if you had any questions for Warlow, you can get us started. I mean, I have a ton, but I'll I'll start Go with like it, basic ones. It. Like who was who was your favorite teammates? I'd say teammate, but I don't want you to like leave anyone out. Yeah, no, there's like some yeah. uh yeah, there's like a whole list of guys I could go through. So like my time in Atlanta, I got tons of friends that I still mm-hmm. kind of talk to, like Rico, who you know just retired. Like he's a guy I kept talking to, Brooks Reed, Stu Parr. I mean, I could name a bunch, but like in terms of like ball playing, like Weatherspoon to me was one of the best teammates that I've ever been with. And probably, probably cause I, you know, I'll sit next to him in a room and he was someone I looked up to when I got there, just like the energy, the on field play. I mean, everything, like if I could mimic someone's game, like Sean was it, you know, and I uh, held him in super high regard. So, but tons of friends though. I mean, I could go down, I mean, I could go down a whole list of guys, but <laughs> Spoon was someone that always jumps out. Yeah. No, I, I love Spoon too. And I'm, I know everyone, like, he seemed like such a fun dude just from watching on TV. And obviously we only get like a tiny slice of what actually happens, but I'm, I'm glad to, it's not just you that's, that's remarked on Spoon, just being sort of an awesome dude, you know, a locker room leader, just a fun guy to be around. So it's, it's what he put on the field was not dissimilar from who he was as a person. So that's, that's awesome to hear. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, I just, coming into the league as an undrafted free agent and we've we've talked to some other UDFAs on the show it's always interesting like we talked to Josh Harris the long snapper who you you've been in Atlanta with too oh, yeah. um about how you know you sort of come in Josh Harris was interesting because he you know bare, he just had to sort of change positions and change his whole career in college but for you to come in as an undrafted guy and get a chance to start early and turn that into such a successful career. What was that like for you just uh, to be able to, to make such an early impact? It was cool. And it was, uh, I mean, very unexpected. Like, I, you know, I mean, I knew what my chances were. I didn't think I was even going to get a UDFA deal at a college. So yeah, I wasn't like banking on it. I remember right before I drove down, like I borrowed, money from my mom because i had zero dollars to drive down to camp and then in my head i was like this is cool i'll get to keep playing ball maybe you know i think we're getting paid like 800 a week or something i was like you know six weeks maybe i'll buy an engagement ring for my girlfriend and like that's kind of where my head was at and i was like i get to keep playing ball and i'm like these guys just came off of the nfc championship game right 2012 i was like this is sweet you know i was fired up and then you know, like just the right things happen. I mean, people went out at the right time that uh, allowed me to get on the field. And, you know, it was it, it gets over romanticized, I think, uh, you know, from outside looking in. But it was just kind of like, I mean, you just show up prepared, you get an opportunity and, you know, you just perform at in that moment. And uh, I mean, I was super, super fortunate to come to Atlanta at that time. I, yeah. I really believe that. Yeah, it ended up working out really well. It was fortuitous. Obviously, fans were excited. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was it was just a, a good set of events. And I think, you know, fans especially don't realize how much that plays into it. You know, the situation that you go into, what sort of happens in front of you. And sometimes it's fortuitous, sometimes it's not. Um, which is why I'm sort of excited to see some of these new leagues, you know, hoping that they can give guys chances that don't get the best situation coming out of college. You know, they, they don't get into an advantageous camp or, you know, they just, it's a numbers game sometimes. So I'm hopeful that these, these new leagues are able to give guys more of a shot, but I'll open the floor uh, to Evan and, and on, on again, if you guys have other questions. And I was going to say, uh, you definitely lasted more than the six weeks that you expected at first. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you elaborate on just how, how crazier that got for you that, you know, once you made the team and, you know, I don't, I, I assume you realize you became like a fan favorite, but I'm not sure that you actually, you know, how, how much you paid attention to that sort of thing. But like, um, I know people in the 
comments. I don't think you're reading it on YouTube, but they're saying like, oh, you oh, were no, my <laughs> Paul was my favorite Falcon uh, on defense for those few years. And like, how did that change for you as a person? Like, you know, going from undrafted free agent to one of the favorite players of many on defense. No, it was cool. It was, um, and I remember it. I remember who it was. Jay Adams was with the Falcons, and he did a bunch of stuff. Like, I mean, not memes or and it, like social media was different back then. At least I wasn't really like on it, and but I did. I saw it all, and it was cool. I mean, like I went from playing you know FCS ball at Delaware to you know I mean the biggest stage you can, which you know you dream about forever. Um, but it was it was it was a little shocking at first you know and then i did i would pay attention to you know the media and stuff it's cool and i loved all of it the slander the, the <laughs> fun the humor in it like i mean i loved all about it because it, it's real you know it's not it's just it's life you know it's unpredictable and um like those were cool moments for me just that that first season where i was just like damn like you know because like and, and and the cool part about coaching college and I go speak at a bunch of high schools, like, I mean, I'm just a normal dude. Like, I mean, I go to some high schoolers and these kids are bigger than me. Like <laughs> in high school, you know, I wasn't fast. I still was never really that fast, but like somehow like you find a way. And uh, I think that was just the coolest part. Like uh, that having gone through that, like now, you know, being in a linebacker room with, you know, people that look just like me with aspirations that, that I have. Uh, it's cool to kind of have that to back up, I think. So, uh, but yeah, like the first season was kind of like, you know, it was, it was, it was fun. I loved it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's very um, cool. Go my ahead. question is uh, regarding your second season. So in 2014, started all 16 games, you had 142 tackles and you know, what was it like? Where, did you just have that sense of just being locked in week in, week out? Did you, you know, keep tabs of your stats of, uh, of the leaderboard because you were, I think, one of the top five or six players regarding total tackles. You had a bunch of Pro Bowl votes as well. So, you know, were, were you were you keeping tabs on, on that as the season was going on? Like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm near the leaderboard. I'm almost there. Uh, a little bit, you know, just, I mean, you got, you got friends that'll send you text messages, yeah, you know, it's yeah. like my best friends are like, this is where you stand. And it's like, all right, man, like, cool. Like, <laughs> Or, you know, like the famous, like the, uh, what's the defensive, like fantasy football type thing, you know, like those people, you know, those are the people that, you know, they kill you on Twitter. <laughs> it's funny. It's awesome. But, uh, so you, I mean, you couldn't ignore it. And it's funny, like, I think 2014 was actually like my worst season. Like, statistically, it's, it, you know, numbers on a paper, you know, without evaluating. But like, I think my ball, that was the worst I've felt playing in my life almost I was just I was really big I didn't feel athletic and I think that was the year if I can like I think we brought in Paul Soliad Tyson Jackson and it was like you know we need you bigger like we need you you know eating space in the middle and then we go through the season and we're just playing nickel all game so <laughs> I think that was that was the toughest and that was kind of like that's when it like flipped I was like I gotta be way physically different but um yeah, I mean, that's – it's a nice thing to have down the road. It's like, hey, you know, 20 years from now, my kids, if they care about football, it's like, I did this this year, you know. But uh, I think in terms of, like, quality ball play, that wasn't a great year for me if I had to look at it like that. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. I mean, it, it – for a lot of reasons, it 2014 was an odd year, you know, from mm. – uh, like, a, from us as media looking at it. It was like a total change up front. It was – we're going to go to these big dudes up front as, as opposed to these, you know, attacking, penetrating guys. And it was sort of a wholesale culture change. Obviously, it didn't end up working out as well as everyone hoped. Um, but what was it like for you um, coming back? You know, 2015, obviously, everything changes. Again, Dan Quinn comes in. The whole new staff comes in. What was it like to go from playing under Mike Smith and that staff to going to a whole different scheme under Dan Quinn? Yeah, way different. And um, I, I loved it. I mean, I love – there's things I love from every season. I think, like, Dan – what Dan brought impacted me farther than just the game. Like, I still 
I was doing a, this is, I'm going to ramble on, but I was doing a graduation speech for like COVID virtually at a school and like, and I'm just winging it. Like, that's just, kind of, I was just, you know, I'll get up there. I'll talk, oh yeah. It'll be cool. oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. People will love it. And then like midway through, and I told Dan this, I was like, DQ's voice, Q's voice popped in my head. And I'm just like, this is something Q would say. And I start talking like, so to me, that was a big moment, like not just football wise, but like in my life, like what Q brought, like we were kind of on the same wavelength, you know, and uh, obviously like there's a whole defensive change and it's cool. I liked what he brought. Like Dan is a people person first and like technique into the person. How can we get you better? Like in your play and less about scheme. He's like players will make the scheme work. And I think that's, you know, that's not always the case, but yeah, you know, I mean, there's no one has the right answer for anything. And I think that was a cool part that like, when I'm evaluating now and we're going through our practices now, like I put more of an emphasis on that than a lot of the other coaches I'm sitting in the staff room with. And I think I get that from, from DQ. So it was cool when he got there, things that, that I learned from him and now, and it was, it was a big switch and you gotta be, you gotta be able to run in that defense. Hence, you know, 2016 Deion Jones enters the picture. Like you gotta be able to roll. So, uh, but I, I was I was a big fan when when they brought DQ in. Yeah, totally different for fans too to see to see the change and uh, yeah, it, you could tell on the field it was different and that's one thing that everyone we've talked to about Dan Quinn says is that it was always about more than just football with him. Um, it was part of why you know even though the Falcons struggled the last few years he was here. It was it was sad to see him go, you know, because he was such a nice guy. Every time I'd had a chance to talk to him, you could just tell he's one of the most liked universally guys in the NFL, and it's always sad when that doesn't work out. But, uh, yeah, uh, I still love the guy. Uh, I'm glad to see that he's finding success in Dallas now, too. Um, and I think, I think if you're a great guy, like he clearly is, that you're going to find success. So um, happy happy for him that he's, he's still still going strong out there. Um, we did have a question from the chat from Jason Gaines. Thank you, Jason. He says, uh, Paul, thank you so much for stepping up at linebacker in 2013 and 14 as a UDFA. Uh, he says, your kick, kick deflection assist in 2013 against the Packers, which led to Spoon's pick six, was one of my favorite plays. Uh, he asks, uh, any important or uh, interesting tips that Spoon was able to pass on to you? So before I get into that, that kick, that that's one of my favorite plays ever. And I don't know why I kicked it, but I did deliberately kick it. <laughs> and I don't know why. It was just a reaction. And uh, But when he scored, if you watch the film, it was it was freezing. I, that game was awesome. But anytime you play at Lambeau is, especially in, in the snow. But we, when we ran down, like, we, I mean, we finished in the end zone at the same time together. And we both go to the sideline, gassed, like exhausted. For some reason, <laughs> it couldn't, it was hard to breathe. And and I think Glenn was our DB linebacker coach. He's like, Spoon, you you take the next series off. And like we're both sitting there. I'm smoked. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's a that's a fun that's a fun play. I like that one. But uh, Spoon just like his energy, and he was a natural leader. Like he really really is. And I I am not verbally, at least in like a team setting. It's just not something that's ever come natural to me. But I mean, every level I ever play at. Yeah, like I think I was captain at Delaware twice, which is unusual for a junior. And then I was captain twice at the Falcons. But like I'm not a natural like get get the whole team in order type thing, you know, more of like a leader through influence, like just how you operate and, you know, being the guy to turn the lights on in the morning. But it was awesome to like watch Spoon and like his confidence and just like every single thing he did, like everything Spoon did. He was super confident in. And then other than that, just, I mean, his ball play, like it's, you know, things that I would try to mimic that I would not be able to do, you know, like the leverage he played with the, the blows he delivered. I think I, the clip of him just hitting a RG three on the sideline one, I guess, before I even got there, but like that just popped in my head, like uh, just all around, man. He was, uh, and obviously I'm biased cause he's a linebacker and I'm coaching linebackers now and I played linebacker. So, I mean, he's uh just the total package of, of someone I try to emulate. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't, this is another question for one of our patrons, Mad Tom K. Uh, thanks, Tom. He 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 was asking sort of about your favorite plays. Obviously, you mentioned the, the spoon pick six uh, that you contributed to in a major way. Any other any other plays that stand out from your time in the NFL? Um, yeah, definitely one, but not one I'm involved with. The <laughs> what what year would it be? Two thousand fifteen. And this I think this is my favorite game of all time that I played in for Atlanta. The the play where Matt Scramble just chucked it up to Julio and he called it over Keekly. Mm-hmm. Oh, I yeah. Think. Yeah, yeah. That was mm-hmm. 2015, right? That mm-hmm. I think and that game was awesome because they smoked us a couple weeks earlier, like 28 yeah. nothing, yeah, yeah. taking mm-hmm. pictures on the sideline. And uh and then we I think we gave them their first loss that game. And that, but like that play, and I remember standing there on the sideline, like, is he going? To, oh, yeah, he's throwing it. Like, throw it to Julio. <laughs> like, and it's just like the catch and the finish, or like the, the Usain Bolt type finish. Uh, that's my favorite play that, you know, I wasn't even involved in. I just had a front row seat. Yeah. You know, I'll never forget that. <laughs> oh, yeah. That that catch, I wanted to get framed and put in the Louvre or something. Mm-hmm. Just, just, it's one of those <laughs> plays. You're just like, okay, well, you know, this is how I know that I'm never going to be Julio Jones. So I'm not going <laughs> to never do anything even remotely similar to that. But, uh, and it's like people are like, oh, Kick- Kickley's a linebacker. It's like, Kickley is not a normal linebacker, okay? He, you don't see it. You don't see people make plays like that over Kickley very often. No. So, um, that is that was an insane play. So I, I agree with you. That's one of my favorite plays as well. Um, yeah, Evan, Adnan, any more questions? Uh, um, yeah, just you came into the NFL uh, undrafted free agent, and in your first year you played all 16 games. Uh, what – advice do you normally give to the undrafted guys because you know the draft is coming up and the vast majority of guys coming out of college won't be drafted into the nfl so what what advice do you give uh guys who are trying to pursue their nfl dream who didn't have their name called on draft day uh regarding your experiences yeah definitely i think this is super important and i mean it's it's it should be obvious but a lot of people don't you know, adhere to it, but it's, it's, you have to be prepared at all times. Like if you get, I've seen guys, you know, someone goes out, I think my rookie year, it might've been, uh, uh, Steven Nicholas, Steven Nicholas Mm -hmm. or somebody like broke a finger in practice. Right. And all of a sudden I'm taking reps with the twos when I've been getting maybe one, two reps of practice. And I've seen it time and time again, it's like someone will go down or someone's cramping up and you need someone to go in and they go in and they don't, they can't line up. Right. Like, you're not afforded this luxury of, Oh, we'll get him right next practice. Like he'll get it done. It's like, you're already almost written off. That's a big part. And that's something like you can control. And it it sounds obvious. A lot of people get jammed up with it. You know, if you're someone who doesn't learn well, like, well, figure a way out, you know, what's, what's going to get you prepared. And then uh, the other thing is special teams. I remember uh, Keith Armstrong. I remember him coming up to me and telling me uh, he was, he was awesome, but he was talking about like, oh, you, you know, something about like playing well in the preseason. Like, uh, you know, that's not why you made the team. He was like, you only made this team to cover kicks and you can do it. You know, so like it was like what he saw <laughs> in what I could bring to the, the special teams game. You know, he was like, I, you're here. You're on this team because of me. So, you know, don't jack this up. Like, take this serious. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that's a big part. Like, I mean, get ready to cover kicks like just every little thing. Just live it. You know, I mean, that's what I did and uh, it, it paid off, you know, it, big time. Just but the preparation, you know, it cannot be set enough. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Evan, uh, did you I, have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, not really to your about your playing career, but, you know, how have you I believe you said you you're coaching the linebackers at Delaware. How do you um, how, how are you handling, you know, the switch from play in the position to now, you know, trying to teach these young kids how to play it, um, you know, coming out of high school, play it at a different level. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely, this is my first year coaching. Oh, okay. And so I was, I got, I really got done playing, I guess a year ago, kind of when I knew I was on practice squad with the jets for during the COVID year for I think a week. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then it was tough to get called in. I was going to end up getting worked out one week but that was the week the the titans had an outbreak and things changed totally yeah, yeah. so that's kind of when i was like all right this is like yeah good time, <laughs> first, good time. first yeah. switch gears 
I do. I, I own a physical therapy clinic. I was training high school kids and I always knew I wanted to coach. And then this opportunity came with the new staff. And um, so like that switch was a little difficult. Just, you know, I mean, we're, we're doing installs yesterday and like, I just, I want to just like get in my stance and like, you know, <laughs> like tell, tell these Don't kids, like, they, shut, yeah. they shut the hell up. Like I, I got this, <laughs> but uh, it's just, it's just, you know, learning learning their their style their athletic abilities how they learn try to take a real like individual approach to it you know i mm-hmm. think is is a big part and not try to have this blanket because some coaches do where it's just you learn this way you play this way if you don't you know we're gonna have a problem and uh just really just taking the time like spending the extra time watching film watching their point of contact tape how they tackle, talking to them, how they learn, you know, are they motivated to that? It's college football, you know, <clears throat> are they here to go to school for free or the, you know, are they really, <laughs> really about this? Yeah. And, uh, it, and I've always felt like I would be a better coach than a player. I've always felt like that. And I always, always- took that, you know, approach to it. And I, I, I really believe that that will be the case for me. So. Yeah. No, I mean, it, that's sort of something I've always been interested in, too, is coaching. Um, you know, my, my football clear, my football career was very short and not very illustrious. So, you know, it would be very easy for me to have a better coaching career than a football career. But how do you like it? Do you like, I mean, I know you just started, but how do you like it so far? No, I love it. So we've been there about, yeah, I think I've been up there since December. <clears throat> um, college football is a totally different game. I've learned that really quick. <laughs> I forgot. You know, hashes are 40 feet apart, not yeah, yeah. You know, 18 or whatever it is in the league. Um, I'm not sure what it is. But, you know, like re- recruiting is a Everything. whole animal. Yeah. And you got the trans- <laughs> you got the transfer portal now. It is like the Wild West. Like, I, feel- I felt like a puppy the first month. <clears throat> you know, a lot of three down defenses, you know, things that are new to me. But it's it's been exciting to kind of learn it and – like I almost felt like a rookie again for a little bit, you know, that first month. But, you know, I, I love it, though. It, it feels like a team. Like when you're with your staff every day, you know, it's like I am a team guy. Like I just know that. Like I would not thrive in an individual sport. I enjoy working with other people and, you know, what can I bring to the team, relying on them. But so I like coaching is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm confident when I say that. Yeah. Uh-huh. I know you were really into powerlifting uh, back during your Falcons days. Are you still? Are you still lifting? Are you in the weight room with the kids now? You know, showing yeah. That done. Yeah, I still I still train as like I'm still playing. It's switched a little bit. A uh, couple surgeries. The knee is. The, yeah. the, I, I had knee surgery in uh, in Philly, and then I had to have it redone in camp. And then uh, so that you know, I was I'll feel good, and then I'll you know. I'll, feel like it's 2013 again and you know and then next thing i know i drive 30 minutes and i can't really get out the car without you know shaking the leg out so <clears throat> it's tapered off a bit but you know the intent is the same it's still yeah. i still yeah. go in there you know fired up uh, i don't i don't know if i'll ever lose that if i yeah. do something's yeah. probably wrong <laughs> yeah it's about the mentality right you know because yeah. we're, we're all getting there you know sooner or later the the body loses some of its ferocity uh and <laughs> the mind has to be you know the one that carries the load after that but you sound like you got the right mindset for that so <laughs> no doubt, man. um we got a question is there any form- oh, go ahead oh, go ahead evan yeah, i yeah. was just gonna ask is there any former coaches you've kind of stole a little or you you're preparing to steal a little bit from that like oh i remember you know for example like dan quinn said this kind of stuff Mm -hmm. like any sort of techniques you plan on using yeah definitely i think uh at least you know because i'm coaching linebackers now and Mm -hmm. i don't know if i'll always coach that i'd like to coach other positions to you know just learn the ins and outs Mm -hmm. of everything but jeff albrick was a big he's he's a big influence on me just Mm -hmm. i was with him for two years he's the dc now with the jets and um but just because like he played and so a lot of the stuff he said in the meeting room, you know, like even just after the meetings were over, like we would sit and draw up on the board or just go over little things. And uh, cause he, he had a real just keen sense of like, and when I talk about like the individual approach, like he took that with me, like I am not a yeah. long armed guy. I six feet two thirty. you know, when I'm trying to take on O-lineman, like I can't just like, you know, 
face and just smash. Like, you know, you try to develop, like, you know, can you shock and get off, like giving yourself space so you can still make plays in times. Like, it's not every player you're going to be able to go and just, you know, bury a gap, get off a block, make a TFL. You know, there are times where you have to butt, give a little ground so you can get on the play, so you can make tackles. <clears throat> so he was the first one to kind of take that real individual approach. And that's kind of stuck with me. That's kind of how I look at, you know, the guys in the room now. You know, so I kind of, I always liked how he had it set up and just like the extra time. And he would just talk ball all day. You know, he, he lived it and, and that's kind of, yeah, I'm on the same wavelength as, as, as him with that. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. We had another question from Jason. Uh, he wants to know uh, what it was like to be on hard knocks in 2014. <laughs> and also, did you ever smoke a cigar with Brian Cox? <laughs> I've not smoked a cigar with Brian Cox. He was a riot, though. He was yeah. he was awesome. It, every time he walked down the hallway, man, he was he was a fun guy to be around. Uh, Hard Knocks, I stayed as far away from those cameras <laughs> as I could. And anytime I was mic'd up, we I think Pat Angerer was there. That camp, uh, the old Colts linebacker, mm-hmm. if I'm remembering right. And I mean, I think we made it as obnoxious as we could, so they wouldn't <laughs> use any of our content. But if I, I, you I, ever, I can go back, what? Oh, I was gonna say, did you ever notice them like hovering around? Like, I don't know how that works behind the scenes. Like, do they hover around to see, like, oh, what are they, what are they talking about? Like, are they yeah. Oh, I think so. Fun? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you'd go into your meeting room one day, and it's just, oh, there's, and it might be different now. They might have it all set up different, but yeah, you know, right. it's like, oh, there's the guy, there's the guy with the camera, like. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, like, it's just let's like stop talking. <laughs> yeah, you just keep kind of like, uh, yeah. So mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> it was a uh, not something I'd want to you know go through every year. But, right. Yeah. Cause you hear about that, the like, teams like actually try to get out of doing it. Did you, did you think yeah. it was more like disruptive than, than anything? I think so. Um, I think, you know, it, it brings like an extra, it's just extra. Like, I think we did Oklahoma drill or something like you're doing drills. You might not do like, yeah. yeah. Mm. I, don't know. I mean, it's, it's for TV. Like, you know, right. and you need it. Like people like it and, and it's fun to watch. And, and I watched it before I started playing and I'll probably watch it, you know, Again, now that I'm kind of like definitely phased out of the league, you know, but uh, yeah, it's just an extra who's mic'd up today. You know, like yeah, you got to know who's yeah. on the mic so you don't say anything stupid. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just it a little stresses. <laughs> the uh, this past season was the first time they did it during the season and it was the Colts and we know how their season dramatically ended. So yeah. I do wonder if like how big of a part that's playing like a, as a distraction. Yeah, no, I think so. It, it it is just every little you know little things just add up. It's cumulative. Yeah. Like it just compounds. You know, it might be an outlet. Like if you're frustrated with something else, you start taking it out on the hard knocks thing being there. It's just mm-hmm. you know, if it's not there, it's better. But yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah well, anything. I I mean, obviously, Falcons fans remember all your years in Atlanta. You did uh, play with the Lions and the Eagles. Uh, I see here that you briefly were with uh, the Ravens too. Uh, I missed yeah, that. that was... Yeah, it was very brief. I, I, I'm reading, but <laughs> wish I, I wish I missed that too. <laughs> that was a yeah. mistake. We, we can get into that. If you want. Was... <laughs> I mean, if you yeah, if you want to dish on it, go for it. And then this uh, is... that was that was a, uh, and I'll just be like brutally. That was like a dark time. Like uh, that was coming off of the second knee. So I had I got, I got to Philly. Yeah, I played with the the Lions and I played pretty well with the Lions. Like I was happy with how I played. It was a good role for me. Like it was two down, four core special teams. Like that's what I'm built for. Like Mm -hmm. I felt like, right? Like, yeah, you want to be out there, but at the same time, like self-awareness is a big part. Like I'm not a man-to-man guy. I'm not a a like coverage guru. Like I can service base, 12 personnel, 21 personnel, first two downs and be good on special teams and that was a good role for me <clears throat> and then i really wanted to play in philly because i'm i live 20 minutes from it yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so i went there and then the first ota practice that's right yeah i knew it was early yeah yeah it was so i and talking to them i was gonna be kind of like what their michael kendricks was like two yeah, down yeah. Mm-hmm. special teams guy and that was the role and first ota practice Red zone, seven on seven, check down, 
tagging off and the other linebacker, I won't say his name. I'll never forget it. But he trips and just didn't really see him. He just stumbles on his own feet and blows through my leg. Mm. So my Eagles career, so surgery, and then we get to camp the next year. Following that, I mean, I missed that camp. And then yeah, we yeah. get, they re-signed me. <clears throat> and then all the hardware kind of like fell out and I had to get surgery again. And I couldn't really bounce back from it. So they, they cut me. And then I had some teams calling a good amount. And I turned down a bunch of offers going to, you know, other teams for the end of the preseason. I was just kind of like, you know, my knee still hurt. I was going down the stairs some days like a, yeah, yeah. a toddler just, on my ass. Yeah. It's like, like it's, yeah. How do you play football on that? You know, <laughs> yeah. Just... So, but the Ravens, I mean, it's only an hour away. My agent was like, hey, just go. They're probably not even going to sign you. They just want to check your knee out. Like, see you in person, you know, because they need linebackers. They might sign you during week two. So I go, and then, of course, like, you get checked out, and they're like, hey, we're going to, you know, we want to sign you. And like, like, the football player in me is like, oh, yeah, like, all right, let's, cool, go. let's yeah. do it. You know, I'm here now. And then just, like, I think all of it, and my wife was nine months pregnant. My kid was, my third kid was coming in two weeks. She was on bed rest, basically. I was just in a weird spot. I shouldn't have gone in the first place. So I <clears throat> basically signed and then, you know, at four in the morning, I was just like, this is not going to work like, family wise, physically mm-hmm. wise. Yeah, I should have stuck with what I was doing yeah. when I turned down the two other teams before <clears throat> and then waited till the season and kind of like evaluated. So I wish I didn't, you know, I wish that didn't happen. Yeah. But fortunately <laughs> enough, I did get to play uh, Joe Douglas called and the Jets had some guys go down. I got to play some more football. Mm-hmm. So it was, a, it was a interesting yeah. and yeah. my whole thing, man. I miss those Atlanta days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was remarkably low drama, at least on the outside in your time <laughs> in Atlanta. So that rarely, that it rarely goes down, you know, as as spotless at the end, unfortunately, as we're seeing with all kinds of guys. But uh, glad you got to play a little bit more football after Atlanta. Uh, I was happy to see you get that good contract from the Lions, too, because I know Falcons yeah, fans we- were like, you know, wanting you to come back, but it's like, I would, I wouldn't turn down three million from Detroit. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and I wanted, I wanted to stay in Atlanta. Like Atlanta to me was like, I mean, it's still like, I'll be a Falcons fan for life. Like <clears throat> I absolutely loved it. I loved what Q had going on there, you know, and I really, I, I still, to this day, I'm going to win a Super Bowl. Like I tell myself that somewhere, somehow coaching, but I really, but yeah, like the Lions kind of made it, you know, I, yeah, <clears throat> can't say tough. no to that. Yeah, yeah with the yeah. wife and kids, and but uh, and I love I love my time in Detroit though. So, so it sounds yeah. like your long term goal is to get to the coaching in the NFL, right? Yeah, I think so. I think if that, I think that will happen at some point. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm coughing a lot. Um, no, no, you're good. I, I am enjoying college though. I think mm-hmm. you know I, it's because you do you get the kids for four or five with the, the COVID and red shirt or some kids are like 23, like yeah. you know, for six years almost right now. And I think that's really, really cool. Like if you can, yeah, especially at the FCS level where there's not so much turnover on staffs, like it's not like mm-hmm. the FBS where guys are getting fired. Like this past year was wild. Yeah. With the amount yeah. of head coach openings, but uh, like you really get to know the kids and I, like, I really believe I can help mold, you know, or just, just give what I have, you know, whether they take mm-hmm. it or not, but just like that excites me just kind of knowing I'll be with this group for four or some years. Cause that's kind of what you don't get in the NFL. Like when I think of, when I miss football, like, like I miss the locker rooms and the guys and like, you really, really get that in college. Like you get, you're in the same locker room with the same guys eating with the same guys for four years. And I think that's really, really cool and special, but I do want to win a Super Bowl. Really, yeah. really badly. Yeah. Really, yeah. really well, badly. So maybe you can come back to Atlanta and do that. I would mean, freaking that would love benefit to benefit all yeah. of us, I think. Yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> the curse the Atlanta sports curse is apparently over now. So, you know, right. maybe yeah. maybe Worlow coming back to the Falcons to the coaching <laughs> staff. That's the last piece of the puzzle. Okay. 
So <laughs> bookmark this for when it happens. Exactly. 10, We're gonna ten years, some years from now. Yep, we're gonna clip but don't, this off. Don't forget yeah. about us. We're gonna be like, hey, Paul, come back on. <laughs> no, I might, I might keep tuning in. I've been on since since eight o'clock, man. I, I've always yeah. gone to the website over the years. You know, oh, yeah. like I've that's, enjoyed that's it. Good to hear. Yeah, then, we hear I'm that some players are aware of us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you you might be the worst. Though. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I love it. none of it, it. I mean, it's all part of it. Like, yes. Yeah. No, it's. it's, it's well, it's, it's mostly like I the told comments. You, the, yeah. the thing with art that makes the Falcolic unique is we're all like fans. Like, yeah. I mean, we oh, came cool. to the site differently, but like, I was a fan in 1996. Like, I've been a fan since, and I just do it. Adnan has his own story of how you know he became a fan. Same with Kevin. Like, so I mean, we we've we knew we've known you for longer than you've known us for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we yeah. definitely appreciate that. Yeah, did you got something else on? Uh, I was gonna say, like, uh, I, I mean, you probably answered the, my question, but I was gonna ask if you're still keeping up with the team and you know what your thoughts are on you know where where they are moving forward. Yeah, a little bit. I don't follow as much as I will next year. Like, <clears throat> I, for some reason, like I didn't get to watch a lot of NFL this year. I would watch like my friends play, like the guys mm -hmm. that I used to play with. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, like I would check in on like Dion and just the guys, the normal, you know, the crew in Atlanta. <clears throat> but I spent more time just kind of following box scores, like you know, anyone I played with. But I do, I will follow next year. I like, I like Foyer. I like the linebacker group. Um, I hope Matt Ron, like Matt, is incredible. Like I hope I was just just because I was listening to the whole show, like. I don't know if you're gonna find a better quarterback than Matt right now. Right. If you can go mm -hmm. get one, like I'd like to see, you know, s them get a shot at a championship with Matt. Yeah. You know, I mean, quarterbacks are hard to find. Uh, you know, you you would prepare for games and you'd play, you'd prepare for quarterbacks, and it'd be like, oh, this we're gonna we can we can get this guy. Like, he can't throw here. You know, like there's always those guys. Like Matt is not one of them. Like right. when you prepare for Matt, like you have to be on your game. So I'd like to see like a big championship push with with him still. You know, behind center, I think would would be awesome. Yeah, and it, it the moves they've made thus far, it's really like it could go either way. You know, we don't know. They've been exceptionally tight lipped about it, which is pretty normal, obviously. But. You know, we don't know what the long-term plan is. Obviously, they, they had a chance to take a quarterback last year, picking in the top five. They did not. They took Kyle Pitts this year at eight. You know, is there a quarterback worth it? We don't know. Will they take a quarterback even, you know, later? We don't know. But, yeah, I mean, I think for all of us, it would be awesome to see Matt get one with the Falcons. I mean, I think we would all love to see that. It's just – Yeah, for sure. It's just you never know at this – at this like, it, it seems to rarely ever work out nicely, like the way you want it to. So I'm, I'm still keeping my fingers crossed – uh, for for a great sort of send off for Matt Ryan, but man, it's it's tough. I mean, I I I, I want it to happen more than anything. So that's, we're just gonna hope. We're just gonna hope. So <laughs> that's, that's all we can do right now is just hope for the best. So. <laughs> um, yeah, guys. Anything else? Anything else for Worlo? Thank you so much for giving us uh, so much time tonight. Did man? Now I'm fired up. I'm fired up to be on here, man. Evan just hit me up on. Instagram, I said, let's do it, man. This is cool. Yeah, well, yeah. The, yeah, the no, thing is, great. somebody mentioned, I wish I could just take credit for it. Someone was like, um, you know, because we've been lucky to get a couple of players on here um, over the last, like, a year and a half or whatever. And somebody was like, hey, um, get, see if Paul Warlow will come on. And I was like, I'm not even sure he has social media, but I'll go look at it. <laughs> uh, sure enough, there you were. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm glad you came on and I uh, not to speak for Kevin, but I mean, anytime you want to oh, come yeah. on and yeah, for sure. talk Falcons or talk Delaware linebacker football, where, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm about, man. yeah, I don't, I don't believe I've scouted any Delaware players this year. Uh, but once, once you've been there for a season, we'll have to have you on, you know, next year, you can tell me, you know, who I should be watching as, you know, potential draft guys, uh, in the, in the next class for sure. So no, um, any, anytime, man. Yeah. We'll definitely keep up with the program. With, yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys. Uh, yeah. Any any final any final questions before we wrap up? Uh, 
I know we had a couple more draft things from fans that we'll, we'll probably get to before we take off. I don't know if you want to be a part of that or not, Paul, but <laughs> I'll, I'll let you guys say, you guys know a lot more. Than I do. <laughs> Way more. Yeah. I don't I want to necessarily would... drag you into, you know, who's your like 10th best wide receiver this year. Or anything yeah, like that, so. yeah. I, I learned a lot over the past hour. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, check out the channel guys. You know, there's like, I got all my stuff. You can hit the website up for all my combine previews, but yeah, yeah no, I don't expect anyone else to, uh, necessarily get that deep into it on here we really appreciate uh all of the great intel all of the great stories uh and like evan said we'd love, we'd love to have you back on but yeah final questions uh you, you guys before we let him go no I just uh, just thanks so much for uh for joining us and for being so gracious and generous with your time you know you know it's uh wednesday night you could be doing a million other things so you know thanks for hanging out with us yeah, cool, man. Yeah, you guys rock, man. I, I appreciate the, the chance to talk. So yeah, we got we got six a.m. winter spring workouts tomorrow. So oh boy, tomorrow yeah, gonna, oh, bright and early. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go get ready for that. <laughs> get a little right. sleep. What's the weather up there? I don't expect it. It's not spring weather yet, is it? No, today actually, I think it was sixty degrees. Maybe. Oh wow. Okay. Like, yeah, not yeah. bad. You yeah. know, All right. northeast, mid Atlantic type. So it's it's been bad. Yeah, we had a good day in the past two weeks. So today was nice. <laughs> Tomorrow probably it'll probably be thirty degrees. Yeah, but. no, I live in Syracuse, so it got cold here today. Yeah. But seems like it didn't. It's not cold there yet, but it's coming. Apparently, we're going to get in, like eight inches of snow this weekend. So I'm in Florida, <laughs> so it's like eighty. Uh, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. with the humble brag, <laughs> big time Sorry. humble brag yeah. there. Yeah, a little bit. So. <laughs> all right, Paul. Well, thank you so much again, and uh, we'll definitely Thanks, have you Paul. back on. We'll hit you up. All right. No doubt, guys. See you. All right, man. Have a good night. Guys, Paul Warlow, just awesome. Uh, so much he's fun. So, he's yeah. so cool. Like, it's cool because you see these people, you know, these former players and stuff, and it's like, you know, you know the thing, don't meet your idols and stuff like that. But, like, we've been lucky. Like, a lot of them are just cool as shit. Like, yeah. as, you know, as great as they were on the field and stuff, like, I don't know. That, that, was, that was cool because it's like Paul Warlow, like, a lot of people in the chat saying, you know, he was their favorite defensive player for those years and stuff like that. Cause he, he was like old school football tackling machine and all that. So seeing him, uh, you know, be just as cool on here was, yeah. that was cool. Yeah. That was the first player I ever, I think got a picture with. At, uh, Falcon. Oh, you met him. I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, I met him. You should have like, told him that. I met him for like a second. Like we didn't really even talk. Oh. It was just like, we just took a, like, I just asked him to like take a selfie with me. But oh, yeah, it, cool. it was like 2013, like Falcons training camp. So yeah, that was like that was a really cool moment. Wow, he didn't know he was gonna meet up with you later on to talk. About the yeah, to, to talk, but it's okay. I'm not that important. <laughs> yeah, that's really all cool, right. Though. Yeah, no, that was great. He was a great guest. Uh, excited to have him back on in the future. Um, and it seems mm-hmm. like his his post NFL career is just getting started. So. Well, it shows like a lot too when when you see these former players go into coaching, like even at college level, like how much they just love being around. Even if they're, you know, like he said, with all the surgeries, even if their body can't really handle the playing, it's just being in that environment. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, he gave some great insight. I loved his uh, his his takes about the Falcons. I'm sure that's what most people care about is, you know, finding out that he was actually hoping to stay with the Falcons even longer. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't pass up the money from Detroit. That was a great deal. So um, definitely. Hey, if Detroit's SB Nation blog wants to give me $3 million, I'll go up there. I'll take it. Yeah. I mean, I would, you know, I would consider writing for Canal Street Chronicles for that sort of contract. But, um, you know, I'd have to think about it, but I'd definitely do it. You know, I'd probably I'd do it for a, a lot less. Yeah, yeah, way less if we're being honest. But bucks, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little more than that, but <laughs> yeah. All right, let me. Uh, I know we had a couple of questions come in right before Warlow got here, so we'll take care of those real quick. From Brandon Brass with the two dollars. Thank you so much, Brandon. He said, "What is our opinion on wide receiver Sky Moore?" And Skylar Thompson, the quarterback. Well, Brandon, I can tell you I have not watched Skylar Thompson really at all. Uh, also, I haven't really watched much of Sky Moore. I know he's come on lately. Um, Sky, I like. I mean, it seems like he has a lot of fans. He does seem to be more of like a slot guy to me. 
And like I've said before, um, I don't think Arthur Smith's offense really values the slot receiver. I think he's going to run more two tight end sets. It's not like they're never going to use a slot, but um, yeah, Evan, Evan, if you need to take off, that's cool, dude. Um, oh, yeah, okay. th- yeah, yeah, no, it, it's fine. Yeah, we can we can go ahead and and, and give you your outro. Oh, you don't he have is- to segue. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. I, no, I, I didn't Birchfield. I gotta yeah. let my dog out. So. Okay, yeah, he's the dog is calling. Thank you so much, Evan. Have a great night, man. <laughs> Bye, guys. Yeah. See you, everybody. <laughs> All right, yeah. Like I say, Sky Moore, I like. I, I do think he's likely to go, you know, day two. Um, but uh, yeah, I just um, I don't think our uh, Arthur Smith would sign off on a day two slot wide receiver. Yeah, I just find it hard to believe. Um, I just don't think it's that valuable. I think they're gonna try to probably go at like hope hope someone like an Austin Trammell works, or they'll just like you know put some of their other guys in the slot or play Kyle Pitts in the slot or something if they need the slot receiver. But yeah, that that's my guess with, with more. And I honestly haven't watched Skylar Thompson at all. I know he's got some fans. Um, but other than that, I, I don't really know anything about Skylar Thompson, to be honest. Um, so can't give you much insight there. Um, we also have mad Tom K with the $3. Thank you, Tom. Uh, he says, how would you guys feel about the Falcons drafting Matt Ariza, the crazy good punter, out of SDSU. I mean, like, in theory, it would be great. I mean, I, I like him, but it just depends. Like, is he there in, like, the fourth or fifth round? In that case, I think it's, like, especially if they get extra picks from various trades. Like, if they have two fifths from Deion Jones and they want to spend a fifth on a guy who could be the best, best punter in the NFL, it's like, okay. Like, I could, I could get on board with that. But, like, anything above a fifth for a punter, I just have a hard time getting behind. Even one as good as, as Ariza. Um... I like Thomas Morstead. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. Yeah, <laughs> Like, I'd rather spend, like, $2 million on Thomas Morstead than, like, a third-round pick on Matt Ariza, So if Thomas Morstead was really, really good last year. Yeah. I think he was player of the week, like, a couple times. Yes. Special player of the week. That was this guy we didn't talk about bringing back, but he's definitely high on the list for me. Yeah. Big time, yes, to bring back both special teams guys, Kulu and Morstead. Um, yeah, I... I don't think uh, uh, I don't think the team's in a position to make a luxury pick on a punter, which you know it would be cool having potentially the best punter in the NFL, but there's there's a lot of holes, uh, <laughs> yeah. especially, especially if it's a third or fourth rounder. Uh, I I would roll with Morstead uh, next season and just just see where just see where we can go with him and you know use those picks on on other positions yeah yeah and it's like would morstead actually cost us two million as cory cutter asked i don't know um he's he's 30 he's gonna be 36 next year he was signed for 1 million 1.1 million or so this he's year but i really enjoyed it like yeah. with the Falcons last yeah. season like, i mean yeah. i would offer him you know a little bit more to make sure he comes back i mean i I don't know why he didn't have more of a market last year. Like the Jets cut him for some reason, which I won't understand. But the, um, Jets, the Jets needed a punter last year, yes. and they'll, they'll need one this year because you yeah. know, they'll probably be punting a lot. Yeah, it's it's odd that the Jets moved on from him. I mean, um, you know, the best punters do make a fair amount of money. Um, but like, yeah, I mean. I, I think you could probably get him between 1.5 to 2. Um, hopefully, you don't have to go, you know, to 2. But, you know, I think, like, the best punters in the league are making, you know, between, like, 2 and two and two, two to 3.5, something like that. So, like, I, you know, I'm hopeful that he would he would agree to come back for, a, you know, reasonable amount. But, yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly prioritize bringing him back as... as cause I, I mean, again, it's just a couple... It's really just a couple of, uh, you know, a couple million at most to, to get a plus starter. Um, and, you're like, you know, I know punter's not necessarily the most impactful starter on your team, but um, to, to have that be a strength, you know, have the special teams be a strength with Morstead and Koo, re-signing both of those guys to, you know, Koo I would sign to like a four- to five-year deal, to be honest. But Morstead, you know, I think you can give him a two-year deal, three-year deal probably. Uh, punters have long lifespans. You know, we've seen punters play – to 40. So, um, he's certainly not shown any signs of so- sh- slowing down. And I think if you give him a long-term deal, you don't, it's not going to be that big. Like you're not going to be putting all this guaranteed money on the line or anything like that. So, um, 
you know, I, I would be totally down to bring back Morstead. I think that's the better course of action. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we didn't get to... Well, we got to most of the free agents, I would say. I mean, I don't... Is there anyone else you really wanted to talk about? Uh, I mean, we didn't talk about, like, the corners, like Isaiah Oliver or Fabian Moreau. I consider re-signing both of them. Um, I definitely... Uh, Isaiah Oliver, especially. Yeah. Uh, shout out to our guy, Reginald Oliver. I, yes, uh, yes. A frequent watcher of the show. Um, Isaiah Oliver was really coming into his own last season uh, as the slot corner. And, you know, it was just, it, it, it sucked. It, it sucked seeing him get hurt in that game against Washington. Um, I would, I, I think because he's coming off that injury, they could get him on, you know, a one-year deal to prove that he can be healthy and it, it won't really break the bank. So, you know, that's definitely one of the guys that, that's high on my priority list to, to try and bring back. Uh, and Moreau is also also fine yeah for, i mean i think if it's cheap I mean, enough you know, him yeah. last year. right i mean yeah i think for what you paid him which was like a little over a million dollars that was great value you know he was cornerback two for you not one of the best cornerback twos in the nfl but like a serviceable one certainly so i mean i would love to get him and oliver back on like one to two million dollar deals if they'll sign him um and that just gives you the flexibility to not need to take a cornerback high in the draft. Like if, if somebody you like isn't there in like the second round, you don't have to force it. So and, and if you want to, like let's say that they fall in love with Sauce Gardner and they they take him even at eight, like that wouldn't be too far fetched to right. to imagine that they'd take him or Andrew Booth at eight or you know, Stingley's also in that conversation. But, you know, all of a sudden that cornerback that you get at eight, he's gonna be the CB2, uh, opposite of AJ Terrell. And now you're talking about Oliver Moreau as your cornerback depth guys, as your slot corner, and, you know, uh, as one of the depth guys, your cornerback four. You're talking about, you know, one of the better cornerback units yeah, yeah. in the NFL. Mm-hmm. It's and, deep, too. You got Darren Hall as another versatile guy that they're probably hoping, you know, they can get more out of in time. And then you've also got Avery Williams, who. It's not a plus starter, but a guy who could step in in an emergency. He's, you know, key special well, teamer. Sudden, so. All of a sudden, you've completely rebuilt this unit after last season going into free agency. That was one of the shallowest, you know, position groups on this team. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I if those guys are affordable, I'd definitely bring both back. Because you could never have too many corners. Like, you can't. Like, you could see two to three guys get hurt in a single game. It's happened. It happens frequently. Because you're playing three of them at a time. So, your cornerback three and four, you know, are going to play. Your quarterback five is probably going to play too. So those guys can't be schmucks. You know, you got to have guys ready to step in. So I, I think, you know, it's fair to say like Fabian Moreau would not be the ideal cornerback two. I think if they went into the season with him as the, the cornerback two, it's not a glaring issue. It's certainly not as good as it could be. But um, I think just getting those two guys back, if they're affordable, gives them a lot more flexibility to, to take – best player available you know they don't have to force a corner pick they could potentially wait on it they could go after a developmental guy like in my last draft i had them taking josh uh, joshua williams from fayetteville state a guy who i think has pretty good upside but he's gonna need a year you know so you could get more flexible with how you address the position add more of a depth guy instead ride it out with moreau and darren hall and, and isaiah oliver next to terrell and then maybe, you know, have have better luck in the future there, not have to spend an arm and a leg. But it really just depends. Like, it wouldn't shock me if Moreau gets his contract to start somewhere, considering how he played. Um, you know, I, I think I think they'll bring back Oliver, at least. I would be surprised if they didn't try, just because of how, of how good he looked here. And um, coming off that injury, you would think the market wouldn't be too crazy. So, I mean, I think you're like, look, Oliver, we, we like what we saw. We're going to offer you, like, a two- or three-year deal at, like, two to three million per um, and I think for the Falcons and Oliver, that can make sense. Like that gives him some security, gives him some guaranteed money coming off a major injury, but it's not a huge risk for the Falcons. And they have the potential of like, if he plays really well this year, then Oliver, it looks like a huge steal. So, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see what he wants to do. It's possible. He'd rather have like a one year prove it deal instead, which is fine too. But, um, yeah, those are the other two big ones. I think that we hadn't talked about, um, yeah, I mean, nobody... I mean, like, the, the safeties, like, Harris and Deron Harmon. Um, I mean, I wouldn't mind bringing Eric Harris back for, like, you know, 
what, 1.3, 1.4 million, whatever he was making last year. I think he's like a good third safety. So, I mean, I'd be fine with that. But um, none of these guys are like huge move the needle types. Um, Anthony Rush, too, uh, to play nose tackle. Because um, they're, they're going to be cutting Tyler Davison almost certainly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Anthony Rush, I like. That's had a hell of a couple of games this past yeah. season. Yeah, so, I mean... And, then, and again, it's the same thing with like Moreau and Oliver and Eric Harris. It's like you you get these guys that ended up being good sort of stopgap guys, guys that performed outperformed their cheap contracts. You get these guys back, you know, pay them a little bit more, reward them, maybe give some of these guys multi-year deals at affordable rates too. Um, but then it, it, it really lets you go into the draft without any huge glaring needs you know obviously there are some like edge is going to be a glaring need no matter what they do um but like other than that it's and wide receiver probably too it's like oh yeah well we have anthony rush to play nose so we don't necessarily have to take a nose tackle we have you know eric harris so we don't have to add another safety unless there's someone there we like we have fabian moreau and isaiah oliver so we don't have to add another corner early so it's like that gives them the flexibility to, to do what i think they want to do which is draft best player available, go after the value, how the draft falls. Because despite what anyone will, t- anyone will tell you, it's really hard to predict what will happen, who will be available. And I think having the flexibility to be like, oh, we we were planning to take a corner, you know, at the top of the second round. But actually, you know, uh, like, I don't know, like Drake London fell because he's hurt. So we'd rather take Drake London here instead of a corner. But because we have Fabian Moreau and Isaiah Oliver, that's fine. That's not going to be hurting our team. So, um or like Vlad said, you know, oh, Travis Jones is still here. Or Perry and Winfrey from Oklahoma. These defensive tackles. Like, we don't necessarily have to reach on someone because uh, we have players elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think if the, I did the math. I think the Falcons signed, you know, Patterson, Aluakun, Isaiah Oliver, you know, Morstead, Youngway Koo at $4 million, um, and like uh, Phoebe Moreau, too. It's like they would still have something like, I don't know, 20 million in space to go sign outside free agents. And that's not a huge amount, but that could be enough to sign a big guy like a James Daniels, um, who's probably my top choice right now. Could also be enough to go sign like a defensive tackle or an edge guy, you know, probably not like one of the highest end names, but somebody who could contribute certainly. Um, so, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens, but, uh, they have the flexibility to do that, and I, I think they should bring back some of the guys that did perform well last year and not just go into 2022 with, like, a whole new roster. But, um, again, if they really are trying to tear this thing down and rebuild, you know, we could see them spend as little as possible, go for more of these cheap deals, and then go into 2023 with, like, a clean slate and, like, 50, 60 million in cap space. I mean, I don't know what they're... What, let me see whether they're at. Yeah, right now they have over a hundred million in cap space for 2023. I mean, they only have 20 players under contract for next year, um, which is a testament to how they didn't sign any long-term deals last year. And if they don't sign any long-term deals this year, they're going to have an enormous amount of space and flexibility next year, and they have a ton of options to clear more space if they want to. So, um, you know, we'll just have to see. We'll just have to see what happens. Um, I will say, though, just real quick, if we are looking at a long-term deal, top of my wish list right now is uh, Marcus Williams. Oh, yeah, I like that, too. Yeah. That's, that's a guy who's 25. He fits the timeline of no matter what you're doing. Yep. And yep. You know, Pro Bowl-level safety. Definitely need a safety. Um, yeah, it's... Um, uh, it, and, I like and that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it uh, does the benefit of screwing over the Saints, too. Um, yeah. Um, I, yeah, yeah. They may not be able to franchise tag him because the tag will will, will cost some money. Uh, I think the tag for for a safety, eleven or twelve million dollars. Yeah, it's yeah. The whole, they, and I you can't they, spread it out. Like you, that's the thing with the tag. You have to pay it all up front. So yeah, they they tagged him. I think last season. Yes. Uh, so the fact that they tagged him last season means that he would make one hundred twenty percent. Yeah, of yeah. That money this year. Mm-hmm. Um. So and you know definitely someone that you would give a long term deal to to decrease the salary the cap hit as much as possible this year, and you would hope that the the that the cap would go up in the coming years to to mitigate that a little bit. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially next year when when the Falcons have an abundance of cap, you know you'll 
that wouldn't be an issue. I, I think there is a clear, clear avenue where they can sign Marcus Williams, even even though they're a bit strapped for cash at the moment. You know, that's a guy that Terry Fontenot knows will probably go after him. Um, yeah, and, you know, Vlad mentioned it in, in the chat. Imagine, imagine maybe Kyle Hamilton falls to you at eight. You come away with uh, Marcus Williams in free agency, and all of a sudden you have one of the one of the best young safety tandems in the NFL. Yeah, that could be cool. Patrolling, yeah. uh, patrolling one side of the field. Right. Yeah, I'd, I'd be into that. Yeah, and guys, I, I say they have you know 108 million or whatever in cap space next year. I assume that's projected with a higher cap ceiling. We don't know exactly what that'll look like, and it only has 20 players under contract. So like. You know, they do have to sign another 32 players or 33 players at minimum. So, I mean, like, effectively, it's like if you signed a bunch of vet men guys, you're probably looking at more like 80 million in cap space or something. But, like, that's still a shit ton of cap space. So, you know, they, they're they definitely going to have, if they don't, yeah. When's the last time the Falcons had uh, 80 million in cap space? Yeah. So, you know, it depends. Like, obviously, the draft class will eat into that to some extent. Um, what Whatever contracts they touch, you know, it doesn't include a Grady Jarrett contract, for instance. So if they sign Jarrett to an extension, that would probably be like $20 million, you know, whatever. But, like, again, they have the money next next year to be able to afford Grady Jarrett's $20 million cap hit and have $60 million left over. So, you know, it, it, it's they have more flexibility next year. That's what this last season of very little spending was about, was preserving this. And I would, I guess, I would be surprised if they sort of reversed course, went out and like did the opposite this year, maximized all these contracts, restructured everyone, signed a bunch of free agents to long term deals. I just, I think they'll sign a few. Like I think we could see like a James Daniels and a Daquan Jones and some re signings, you know, for long term. Like like we said, Young Way Koo, maybe Thomas Morstead, Oliver Foyer, that sort of thing. But like, um, yeah, I just. Uh, I don't know. I would be shocked, I guess, if they were sort of totally reverse course, go for this all in with Ryan approach now. But we don't know anything like we don't know anything more than you guys do. We can only read the tea leaves and the tea leaves to me suggest a rebuild. But, you know, I've been wrong about a lot of things. I was adamant that they were going to take a quarterback at four last year. So, you know, I've not always been right about everything. So things could change. Things could be different than we think. But uh, just keep it in mind. Uh, and we'll obviously track it and we'll see what happens. But, uh, Anand, thanks for, uh, for staying late, uh, tonight. We, uh, had a lot to talk about and we had a great, tremendous, long interview with Warlow. Uh, Anand is at Say Which Way on the Twitters. Anything else you're working on, Anand, you want to let the people uh, know about? Yeah, a uh, big thing is, uh, a few years ago, I wrote this big primer about the franchise tag, uh, its history, what it is. Uh, you know, everything you could want to know about the franchise tag. And every year since then, I've been updating it uh, with uh, what the tag numbers were last year, what the tag numbers are expected to be this season, uh, the players who got franchise tag last year, a history of uh, unique franchise tag cases over the years. Um, just because uh, the window for the franchise tag did open, a couple days ago and it's going to be open until uh, March 7th this season. So yeah, definitely check that out. If uh, in case you have any curiosity or any interest regarding the franchise, tag, and of course, from a Falcons perspective, I go into Atlanta's history with using the tag, which isn't very, isn't too extensive. Yeah. They really haven't relied. They didn't really rely upon it much under Dimitrov. Um, You know, we will, we will see um, if that changes under Fontenot. Right now, they don't really have anyone worthy. I guess the first player I would sort of think might be an option is Grady Jarrett next year. If they can't, if they do, you know, hope to resign him and it, it, negotiations stall, that's probably the and, first one I could think of. But um, yeah. Grady Jarrett is one of the three players in Falcons history who's gotten the tag. Actually, all of them were under Dimitrov. So Dimitrov didn't really use it much. Mm-hmm. But nobody before Dimitrov ever used it yeah. uh, for the Falcons. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it was Grady Grimes and Thomas Morstead, the punter. So yep. that's that's a bit of trivia right there. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. But, and much like it happened with Grady, I do think it will lead to a long-term extension, you know, before they actually have to pay out the tag. But 
Um, they got it that uh, lit, I remember in the eleventh hour. With yes, Drake. literally last second. Yep. So. And technically, I don't know if the tag is going to be next year, but just since we're on the topic, if they were to tag Grady Jarrett, uh, and if it were this year's number, the cap hit would be sixteen point eighty-eight million dollars. I would expect that to be north of seventeen million dollars yeah, yeah, yeah. for a defensive tackle. So that's that's just something to to look out for, and that's something that uh, you'd see uh, you'd get with uh, within the article. Yep, yep, that is something to consider for sure. And definitely check that out, guys. Very illuminating article. Um, as for me, Kevin Knight at Falcoholic Kevin. I'm sure you guys have seen if you've been following the site this week, but I have a ton of content coming out. Um, all my combine previews, I've got my mock draft. Hold on one second. No, I could get the sneeze out. Oh no. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I have my cough button here. So, you know, nobody had to be subjected to that, but, um, yeah, like I said, combine previews for all the positions, uh, we're through linebacker. We're going to have cornerback on Thursday, safety on Friday, offense starting this weekend. Also going to uh, my mock draft was on Tuesday, um, so check that out. And uh, yeah, Combine will be starting late next week, so look forward to that too. It appears crisis has been averted, and the Combine will be going on. You know, the NFL pulled back their very strange last-minute draconian uh, measures with the Combine, which is all very weird and strange, and it's all been canceled. So luckily, everything's fine with the Combine. Um and we'll just hope, hope for the best there, and it's going to be very illuminating. So until then, guys, we will see you next week, same time, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, here on the Falcoholic Live for myself, for Evan, for Adnan, and for Mr. Paul Warlow himself. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Like and subscribe if you haven't done so already, and check out the Patreon page if you're interested in supporting the show. That's patreon.com slash falcoholiclive. Um, we will talk to you guys next time. Have a great night, folks. Cheers.